So I've borrowed these lecture slides uh, from a, a theo theology lecture um, from the Anglican Studies course. And so it might be quite intense. <laughs> and so I'll, I've already removed or culled half of it. Um, but if there's anything that needs unpacking further, do let me know and I'll do my best. So communion has a number of names. And so we have uh, Eucharist, uh, which we tend to call it uh, in the Anglican tradition. And Eucharist uh, just means thanksgiving in Greek, apparently. Um, Eucharistia, giving thanks, thanksgiving, um, used in uh, the Greek-speaking community and in the West. Uh, it is also called the, the Mass, um, typically in the Catholic tradition, and that came from uh, the third century. Now, it was one of the um, early church theologians or bishops. It might have been Augustine, not 100% sure, but it appeared in one of their writings, and so we started calling it Mass. And Mass actually means dismissal, so to sort of go out. And Holy Communion, that's uh, another name of it. And yes, I like what you uh, said before about communication and union. Yeah, because that's uh, basically what we celebrate. And one of the things we try to do in communion is communicate with God and celebrate our union with him and with each other. And it's also called uh, the Lord's Supper. So it's kind of like it's toned down kind of name. Oh, yeah, I'm breathing too heavily, so I'm just going <laughs> to... Feather in. Great. <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. So what is the Eucharist? So sacrament of thanksgiving. So thanksgiving is a, a great theme of communion. And it's a recalling of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It can also be considered like a family meal. I'm good. And we celebrate, yeah, our union with Christ. And we prepared for service in the world by doing so. So a few things, the Eucharist, uh, a few points of what this person thinks the Eucharist is. So we've got the sacrament of thanksgiving, the Eucharist, uh, given by Christ for the continual recalling of his life, death, and resurrection, family meal, um, going, that's what I just said, really, isn't it? So we, here we've got uh, what we call the institution narrative. So the institution narrative, uh, the words that Jesus is said to have used in the upper room with his disciples on the eve of Passover. And so that appears in the Gospels. It also appears in Corinthians. So I'll just read this one for us. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. So this is Paul talking. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So a lot of those words might sound really familiar from a typical Eucharist. Those are the words normally said by uh, the priests presiding over the Eucharist. So there are also the Gospels, uh, where the institution narrative takes place. We've got Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22. And there's a question there, what's missing from this list? Any guesses? The Gospel of John. Yes, because his is a bit different. <laughs> so in his account of the Lord's Supper, he has the foot washing uh, so Jesus took off his outer robe and he washed the disciples' feet, um, saying that he came as one not to be served, but to serve. And that was this great image of, of servant leadership. 
And he says, as I've done this for you, go and do likewise for others. But he doesn't mention anything about bread or wine. <laughs> in fact, that appears a lot earlier in John's Gospel, in John 6. So, And this is what Jesus said. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And they took it quite literally. So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And you can see that those thoughts starting about, you know, the communion, the bread and the wine really becoming the body and blood and the, the flesh and the blood of Jesus. So those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. So that's where a lot of our theology around communion comes from. So in the Synoptic Gospels, so the Mark, Matthew, Luke, the three Synoptic Gospels, because they pretty much mirror each other, and then John is a bit different. <laughs> and so uh, it's the Last Supper that was celebrated on the night of the Passover, and the Passover is typically a Jewish, Jewish tradition of remembering the exodus from Egypt and the marking of the doorposts with blood so that the angel of the Lord would pass over them and not kill them. And so they were able to escape. And so uh, Jewish traditions also had a form of uh, Eucharist. So they uh, had a meal um, where bread was broken. And if you didn't have bread in your meal, it wasn't really a meal. And so they had bread and they had cups of wine. And whoever was sort of the head of the household was the one who was breaking the bread. And they would do a libation or a, a sort of a blessing uh, over the, the bread and wine before they all ate. Just like we kind of say a prayer before we eat our food. That's what they were doing for a long period of time before Jesus and so the church understands that Jesus, when he presided over that meal and broke bread and, and blessed it and then gave it to his disciples, that he was looking towards a new covenant. And the new covenant being that uh, Jesus came to save us and we are to love our neighbour as ourselves. So the earliest sort of examples sort of after the Jewish tradition, after Jesus, the early church had a complete meal. So lots of food and other stuff. I'm not quite sure what exactly they had at this meal, but it was, uh, some people called it an agape or a love feast. And so uh, later on, there became a time where the, the actual feast meal became separated from the uh, bread and wine Ritual at some point. And some of that we get from, I think, is later on in Corinthians where Paul is warning them against things that are not quite right with the way that they're doing the Eucharist. So they've got uh, people there that are hungry and people there that are just gorging themselves and not really sharing. And actually, they're not supposed to be focusing on the food, but they should be focusing on Jesus. And so Paul's clearly not happy with, and some of them are getting drunk. <laughs> That's quite rude. <laughs> and so Paul's yeah, pretty much outraged at how they're handling the Eucharist. And so by the fourth century, the meal itself was separated out from the bread and wine ritual. And we also have a document called the, uh, the Didache, uh, which is quite an early document, um, yeah, quite close to the Gospels. Um, it says, I think, that it's authored by the Apostles, but people aren't quite sure whether it really is or whether it's someone just writing, oh, yeah, it's by the Apostles, <laughs> so it has authority. Uh, so basically that contained some more instruction on how to have this bread and wine ritual or the Eucharist, and that perhaps it should be on a Sunday, 
that we should come together and break bread and hold Eucharist. And then we have in the second century, uh, Justin Martyr, who uh, is an early church uh, theologian, and he describes the taking of bread and wine and saying a Eucharistic prayer over them. So now we've got uh, the the blessing of the bread and the wine, and then someone saying a prayer over the bread and the wine, and then distributing the bread and the wine. And then we also hear from Justin Martyr of people taking the bread and wine out to people that couldn't be present at the actual Eucharist. Yes, here we go. (laughs) So we've got the early church understood that something was happening with the bread and wine because in scripture we hear Jesus saying, actually, this is my body and this is my blood. And so if we are praying for this, as Jesus commanded us to, then Jesus must be present somehow. And so... The earliest understanding was, oh, we've got some more Justin Martyr, and he says, for not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, so it's not just bread and wine, but in like manner as Jesus our Saviour, having been made flesh by the word of God, and both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word which from our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, is the flesh and blood of Jesus who was made flesh. So it's kind of like a, he has a bit of a circular argument there. But basically, not just plain bread and plain wine anymore, but it's become somehow the blood and flesh of Jesus. So some people call this a realist view, that Christ is really present, that there is some sort of transformation that the bread becomes the body and the cup, or what's in the cup, the blood of Christ. And then you could go in the other direction, which is a symbolic one, which the elements of bread and wine are simply symbols. So the wine is a symbol of Jesus' blood, and the bread a symbol of Jesus' body, but they're a sign that points to a reality. So we've got a visible sign that, yes, it is visibly bread and visibly wine, but it points to Jesus somehow. (laughs) And that's a more symbolic one. Uh, Yep, the council said it was transubstantiation. (laughs) So in the year 1215, we have a letter in council that said the elements still look like bread, it still looks like wine, but actually it's the body and blood of Christ contained in the species of bread and wine. And so it's transubstantiated by the divine power, the bread into his body and the wine into his blood, as the words of consecration or the words that are prayed over it. So this is the theory of transubstantiation that we heard of earlier. So that's the wine becoming physically Jesus' blood and the bread physically becoming Jesus' body. And it's all around, they they argued about this for centuries, and we still argue about it now, but they were talking um, more Greek philosophical thought around the idea of matter or the idea of substance. So they were talking about the substance of the bread and wine turning into Jesus, while the outward characteristics remained the same. So it looked like bread and it looked like wine, but the substance or the matter of it had changed into being Jesus. So we get some Greek philosophical thought coming in here. So it's the change in substance isn't perceptible to the human eye, but metaphysically it has changed. (laughs) And then they argued about all sorts of things like color, smell, shape. Does it smell like Jesus? (laughs) And then... Uh, So we're talking the medieval ages now, before the 15th century, well before the 15th century, I think before the 13th century. So they understood what was happening in communion in a semi-kind of magical way. And so um, it was revered because it was Jesus, or perhaps we should be, you know, adoring communion. Um, We should be treating it specially. And 
there is some truth to that, that there should be some reverence with communion, I think. But, you know, can we take that too far? Maybe. And so some people actually used to steal the communion and do things with it because they believed it contained some magical power. And so when we had the Reformation, we had some reformers coming and they would mock the Eucharist. They'd probably actually come to a Eucharist and yell out things. And so one of the things they yelled out was hocus pocus. And that's where that term comes from, because the priest in Latin would be standing there saying, hoc est corpus meus, which corpus is the body. Um, so they're talking about the body of Jesus there. And so they just came in the back and yelled out, hocus pocus, because <laughs> no one could really understand what was going on, because it was all in Latin. So in the Reformation, we get um, more arguments. Um, one of the key things in the Reformation, and this is quite happily coming off the topic of being Anglican, actually, um, where we have the main characters of the Reformation uh, having different views on the Eucharist. And so uh, Martin Luther, uh, German, a uh, reformer, uh, refused to accept that they were anything that was not connected with the explicit words of Christ. So basically, he's saying that the sacraments are sacraments of Jesus commanded them to be in Scripture. So that's why he says there's two sacraments. There's baptism, because that's commanded by Jesus, go and baptize uh, people of all nations, and communion. Um, we had that institution narrative earlier. And then another thing that Luther um, argued for was that uh, laity, or basically everyone, should be able to have it in both kinds, wine and the bread, together. Because I think they were only allowed the bread and just the priests had the wine, I believe. And then, so we had some other um, reformers, I was going to say performers. Uh, we've got Zwingli and Calvin, and they argued against transubstantiation. So we've got a big change in thought here. And so, yes, uh, there's Luther's argument. Basically, the elements remain unchanged, but they're distinct. They are divinely appointed media, so media being like an object. They are divinely appointed objects for communicating the heavenly substance of the body and blood of Christ. So he's saying there's actually no change in the substance now. There's nothing metaphysical going on. But the substance of both bread and wine are Christ present together in all of it. So Christ is present inside the elements, with the elements, under the elements, <laughs> all around the elements. And, um, but there's no change in substance, but somehow Jesus is present within it. And that is called con substantiation. Are we confused yet? <laughs> so we're moving away from the uh, real uh, change from the uh, bread into flesh and the wine into blood to more Jesus is present, but we're not quite sure how he's present. But there's some sort of change here. And then we have others who are sort of in between <laughs> both of the uh, views. And, yeah, we've got Zwingli with, uh, he was a Swiss reformer, and, yeah, he opposed transubstantiation. Um, he took Luther to task, and they had public and private arguments. Um, but the key thing with Zwingli is he said that the Eucharist was more of a memorial, so that's the purpose behind communion, that we, it's a solemn commemoration of the death of Christ. And he called it a remembrance. And so we each actually put our own, whatever we think communion is to us, onto communion, and that's what Zwingli did. So for him it was a remembrance, a remembering meal. And so we've got Cranmer. Uh, now, if you remember, Cranmer was... Archbishop of the Church of England, um, sort of during and after the Reformation. So he wrote the first prayer book, Book of Common Prayer, which contained our Anglican theology. And he said that uh, the doctrine, he had a doctrine of the real partaking of the body and blood of Christ rather than the real presence. 
So we partake in the body and blood of Christ. And that they're more of a sacramental sign. And so Christ is present when we receive it. So it's kind of less about the change in the elements, but more the change is within us when we receive the bread and wine. So it's a, a changing view again. And then we've got the good old 39 articles. And this is what Cramer wrote. So he's saying that we should not have it in Latin, it should be in English, and we should actually say what we mean. Um, the sacraments are effectual signs of grace, two sacraments, baptism, communion, denied transubstantiation, uh, communion of both kinds, please, and that when we receive communion, we receive Jesus' body and blood by faith. And... I'm going to play a video now. <laughs> so I found this video quite good. So it's um, one of the ones we used earlier. And this one is it's done by the Nelson Diocese. And it's, I think it's the Dean of Nelson Cathedral. And he's talking about um, us being a sacramental church and what that means, and then a bit about communion and what that means. So that might be helpful for us. When you look at the history of the Anglican Church, there are some practices that make it very distinct from the Roman Catholic context in the 1500s. But there are some similarities. Those who began the Anglican Church did not throw everything out to start again. They retained some practices and traditions that were helpful for Christians, as long as these did not conflict with the teachings of Scripture. The Anglican Church is therefore also a sacramental church, meaning there are some church practices that are seen as special, especially Holy Communion and Baptism, which are actions begun by Jesus himself. So what is a sacrament? First, I must note that sacraments identify with what is called an incarnational theology, meaning God made the world and Jesus, as God with us, fully entered into our physical existence as a human. Therefore, God works through his created world. There is no separation between physical and spiritual. A sacrament, then, is a physical symbol that conveys an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. These are physical signs that announce that Jesus is present. The three most common symbols we might see in church are water for baptism and bread and wine for Holy Communion. These physical elements symbolise God's promise of grace and mercy. They are signs of Jesus' real presence in our lives and they convey spiritual power through the Holy Spirit when we receive them by faith. God promises his love and grace, and through the sacraments, God delivers on that promise. We have already mentioned Holy Communion in the context of worship as the second part of the pattern of word and table. So let us look at what we mean by Holy Communion as a sacrament when we talk of the bread and wine and the body and blood of Jesus. Holy Communion represents a shared meal as the children of God gather round the Lord's table. Jesus gathered his disciples and broke bread before he died. And when Jesus comes again, we will eat with him in the kingdom of God. In the meantime, Jesus has given us this meal to share. In this meal, we respond to what we have heard as we remember Christ's death and anticipate his second coming. 
as I mentioned before, after hearing God's story of creation and redemption in the first part of the service, we then respond in the second part during the time of Holy Communion, when God's people gather around the Lord's table to share this meal. As we eat, the outward sign is the bread and wine. The inward sign of God's grace is Christ's body and blood given for us on the cross. Now, there are a number of different interpretations of how this happens. For Protestant churches, such as the Anglican Church, Christ's presence is real but spiritual. This is seen in the words that are said as we are invited up to receive. Draw near and receive the body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ in remembrance that he died for us. Let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. A slightly different interpretation can be found in the Roman Catholic Church where Christ's presence is both real and physical. The bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Jesus. Now, rather than dwelling on the differences, the key point is that in taking and eating, we remember what Jesus has done, and in a spiritual sense, in eating his body and drinking his blood, the Holy Spirit transforms our heart, our soul, our mind, and our bodies as we are continually fed and spiritually nourished to be sent into the world. Is might go to there's a couple of Bibles under each of your tables, and I've got a quick exercise for us that if yeah, a couple of you grab a Bible each, and then if we look at the institution narratives, and a little activity for us to do is amongst your the groups that you're roughly in, looking at. Um, six things after reading the institution narratives that are up there. They're a little bit small. So we've got Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 to 29, Mark 14, 22 to 25, and Luke 22, 14 to 23. So having a look through those, what are six either actions that Jesus did or phrases that Jesus said, your most important six that we could have in a Eucharist. So you're basically looking at those bits of scripture, what are the six either phrases that Jesus said or actions that he did that are important? Okay, what have we got? Uh, what were our sort of top actions that Jesus performed or the words that he said that we consider sort of important between all three of the stories? He gave thanks. Yeah, he gave thanks. That was in all of them. Well, I've got a list here as well. <laughs> yep, he broke the bread. Sorry? He prayed, yep. Yep, yeah, they were all to eat and drink. Yep, yeah, nice. <laughs> Great. Um, pretty much. Uh, so I've got uh, a little list here as well, and this is just what this person thinks as well. So give thanks. Uh, he broke bread. Uh, he said, this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, and he said, this is my blood. So those things generally happen in all three of those um, institution narratives. And so those are the sort of the key elements that we do in communion, that we, we pray and we give thanks. Uh, we break the bread at one stage. 
Um, we say that this is Jesus saying, this is my body, and we take a cup, and we say, this is my blood poured out for you. Just flicking through. Where do we get up to? Not that. <laughs> So we talked about transubstantiation, which is um, it becoming the flesh and uh, blood of Jesus. And then we talked about consubstantiation, which is Jesus being present in the elements somehow, above, below, inside, around. And now we've got our receptionism. So this is Richard Hooker, another Anglican theologian, uh, saying that he doesn't deny the real presence of Jesus being there, but... It is to do with us receiving as well. So when the faithful communicant receives together with the bread and the wine, the blood and the body of Christ, we receive by faith Jesus. And this is a bit closer to what we believe in the Anglican tradition. So again, in the Anglican tradition, um, someone mentioned it earlier that we tend to say things are a great mystery. <laughs> and so we do try to not get too fixated on what exactly is happening, but just the fact that Jesus is present to us um, in the elements and when we take the elements by faith and with thanksgiving. And so we don't deny that Jesus is really present within the Eucharist itself, within the elements, but we also acknowledge that there's no physical change in the elements themselves and that it has something to do with us coming to receive Christ by faith as well. So it's real presence, but also symbolically by faith. Yes, and so, again, being the Anglican Church, we don't all believe what I just said. <laughs> and so we've got different um, sort of stances in the church. And you may have heard of some of these terms before. We've got a high church, or we might call them Anglo-Catholics, uh, closer to the Roman Catholic tradition, but Anglican. And we've got the broad church, which is yeah, the majority in the middle. And we've got low church evangelical. And so, well, in terms of communion, at least these terms may mean other things, but in terms of communion, uh, typically high church Anglicanism is greatly influenced by the Catholic tradition. So they might be closer to transubstantiation. Um, so they, they value the sacramental life of the church. So we're talking like bells and smells and... Um, icons and um, albs and yeah the whole shebang the whole works um, and they have a high regard for the example of the saints like they lived a holy life they um, perhaps were martyred for their faith uh, they often call it mass and they believe strongly in private confession or the reconciliation of a penitent which is also a right that we have in the Anglican Church. It's a sacramental act, but not uh, on the same level as communion or baptism. But it's to do with a priest forgiving um, or declaring absolution over your sins. Uh, I've gone to low church, evangelical. So um, scripture um, is sort of supreme. Um, salvation through faith alone, uh, not by your works. Uh, usually, yeah, um, do worship with a prayer book, but with much less ceremony. So probably our 10 a.m. is closer to this. We do have elements of the prayer book within the service, but there's much less ceremony. And we tend to minimize the emphasis on the priesthood and the sacraments and the ceremony, but actually we're all here to worship Jesus together. Uh, broad church, so that's somewhere in the middle. So that I think this would have been what I came from. 
<laughs> or was familiar with when I began my uh, Christian journey. So it's kind of like the space between high and low traditions. So um, wearing albs, but also, uh, yeah, not uh, putting the emphasis on the priest, but on all the people that are helping with the service. And yeah, just a slightly different theology. Um, so there's not all, all the ceremony. There's some ceremony. Um, there could be a worship band in the corner kind of thing, but they, they wouldn't take the center stage because the, the altar with communion on it would be the center stage kind of thing. You can sort of tell where the church that you enter into is on the scale of things by where items in the church are placed. So uh, if they had, say, the band in the middle or at the front, that might have a sign that it's probably a low church evangelical church that you've walked into. Um, if it's a gigantic altar right in the middle, maybe like here, right at the front, that might be a, a high church. Or maybe if there's a, a lectern that's the main focus, um, they might have more of an emphasis on the preacher or the teaching rather than the ceremony, and that might be a broad church kind of thing. And so this is an Anglican Eucharist. <laughs> they're all robed up. I have lost count of how many priests are in that photo, but they're all somehow involved in the Eucharist. And that's an Anglican church, just one person behind a pulpit. And there'll, there'll be communion there somewhere. Or not. The yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So two Anglican churches, both celebrating communion, but they look completely different, and they have a different theology on it, actually. So how do we understand the Eucharist? Uh, so there are different uh, ways of understanding, like there's the remembrance before from Cranmer. And so here um, we can see it just as a meal. So it's a meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night before he died. So it's a meal in a symbolic sense. So we're breaking bread together. We're sharing food and drink. And so on special occasions in ancient Israel, they would, and they still do, share a meal. And I guess we do too. If we're celebrating like a birthday or something, we might have a dinner or a cake or we might go out for dinner. So it's a celebration. And there's lots of feeding stories in the Gospels, like the feeding the 5,000. That's right. Yes, that is an important part of communion, that um, we're meeting with Jesus and he is sort of nourishing our souls, feeding our souls. Because um, Jesus says that uh, those that drink of me will never be thirsty. Those that eat of me will never hunger because I am the, the bread of life and the spring of life. So we're feeding on Jesus in our hearts and we're being nourished. We're meeting with Jesus and he's sort of, um, giving us what we need. And it might be that he's preparing us for our work out in the world after the service, or it might be he's just meeting with us in our brokenness and our hurt, or whatever we're feeling at the time, and making us whole, comforting us. Oh, one more thing. So we're all gathered around this table together, and we're all sharing in this meal together and we've got that memorial um, so do this to remember me and it, there was a word in the version that we read which was in memory, in memory of me and that, those words come from the institution narrative and so Jesus took, he blessed, he broke and he gave so it's remembering Jesus' life and his death and what he did for us um, and it's a calling of, and, and this is part of our liturgy as well, we recall the events that God did in the past. So there might be a, a God created us. Um, there might be sort of a retelling of the story that we fell away, but then Jesus came and he redeemed us and he was a sacrifice for our sins. We re might recall the story of Moses, of the Israelites leaving Egypt, um, all the great things that Jesus did for us as God's people throughout history. 
Um, you might tend to focus on the real presence, that um, some people find Jesus more present when they're worshipping to music, and other people might find Jesus more present to them at that moment of communion, when they go up and when they physically do something with their bodies, when they put out their hands to receive Jesus, or when they, they put the bread into their mouth and they have that moment of connection with Jesus. And that might be the moment of connection with Jesus in their whole week or whenever they're taking communion. Uh, it could be taken as sacrifice. Uh, so not just a killing or a shedding of blood kind of thing, but uh, just a remembering of Jesus' sacrifice, that he was the sacrifice for our sins. So that might be that aspect of, yes, we're forgiven because of what Jesus said. So we might connect with Jesus in that way, that I'm coming to communion as a forgiven sinner. And it's, uh, we tend to believe in the Anglican Church that it's not a repetitive sacrifice, so that when we're celebrating Eucharist, we're not continually sacrificing Jesus each time we're breaking the bread or whatnot. So it's just a remembrance of Jesus' once and for all sacrifice for our sins. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah. uh, are, there, are there any things that we think of when we go up to receive communion? So for me, I tend to think of a few things. Uh, I tend to think that it's like a, a vigil that, we're, that Jesus left us with, that he said, uh, take this bread and eat it, and take this wine and drink it. And I will not, I think further along in some of the institution narratives, he says, I will not uh, touch wine or eat or drink with you again until I'm in heaven until you were drinking and eating with me in heaven. So it's like this vigil that we left that Jesus commanded us to do on earth, that we do as we wait for Jesus to come again, or us to be with Jesus again and celebrate with him in heaven. Uh, for me, it might be a moment of pause, of stillness, and that I'm doing something physical with my body, that I'm eating the bread and drinking the wine, and I'm remembering Jesus and asking him, what, what do you have for me this week? Again, that nourishing of the soul of, um, what do you want me to do with my week? Or are you saying anything to me? So it might be just a waiting on God, um, a bit like a prayer time, actually, but condensed into that <laughs> moment of communion. Um, when I go up to communion, um, I look at my empty hands, and I think that without Jesus, I am empty. Um, I have nothing, and I've come to be filled um, by Jesus. And those are a few of the things that I think about when I come up to receive communion. And so we might celebrate some communion now. <laughs> are there any questions? I mean, we've got questions on the board, but... <laughs> And so for this one, I'll run through uh, what we're sort of doing or some thoughts about what we're doing. So at the moment, I'm putting on a stole. Um, in a higher church tradition, I might be wearing an alb during uh, the Eucharist as well, but at the moment, I'm just wearing a stole. Um, so a stole is typically a sign of office. Um, so I'm wearing it around uh, my neck like a yoke. Um, so this is how a priest would wear their stole. So I'm yoked with Jesus in the work that I'm doing that God has called me to. Um, so that's, um, I'm doing a priestly act, um, something that um, I believe that God has called me to do, and hence um, I'm wearing the stole as a symbol of that. And there'll be, you know, you ask three Anglicans why they wear a stole, and, you know, you'll get five different answers. <laughs> and so we've got a number of things here. So we've got a, this is a burse, and there are some different views around burse and veil, and I'm not quite sure what they are, um, what those views are, 
but basically they didn't have a lot of colour um, or you know technology or things like that um, back in those times. So they uh, had colour in things like the vestments or the things that they put on the table or things around the church, and that's kind of what, what you're only left with. And so we have these things burst and veil to bring the some liturgical colour. So I've chosen red because I left my stole at home, so I'm borrowing this one. Um, but red is typically for like Pentecost and for ordination and sort of great feast days and things like that. Um, green is for ordinary time, that's up there. And so it's a way of adding colour. And also, uh, typically we have lit candles. Actually, I might just light them there. That, that's easier. Ah, that's a light too. <laughs> and again, there's different views on candles as well. And so some people um, tend to think that, yes, you should have um, at least one candle or you should do the Eucharist between two lit candles uh, because it symbolises um, Christ's presence um, in the flame, and that's just a symbol that's been around for years and years and years. And so it's just some extra symbolism, and yeah, sometimes people get um, yeah, different views on things, so there's different views on all these things. And this is a veil, again a way of um, introducing some colour, uh, also sort of protecting, I guess, the, the elements from flies and things like that. And some people put, put that out the front just to provide some colour as well. And again, just some extra protection for the bread from flies and whatnot. Um, the altar rail uh, used to be much bigger than that, and that used to be to keep dogs out because um, they used to go and nom and eat all the bread. <laughs> but now they're smaller and we kind of kneel on them. <laughs> And so I'm getting out now the priest's wafer. And so this is a large wafer. Um, it was actually quite a small wafer. There are some of them that are like the size of a dish plate, and they're absolutely massive. Probably more for a cathedral context, so you can actually kind of see what's going on from a mile away. Would anyone like gluten-free? doesn't need too much explanation, but I'm putting out some wafers. <laughs> yes. Why wafers and not just more bread? Oh, I feel like I did know the answer to this at one time. <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess some practical things are that, you know, bread could be expensive to get every week, so it's cheaper to have a, a little rice um, wafer. Um, it could be because that when you have a chunk of bread and then you drink the wine from the chalice, the bread ends up in the wine, <laughs> and that's just a bit nasty for everyone involved. <laughs> yeah, so there's that aspect of it. Um, the other is that it's um, unleavened. Um, there are some different thoughts about should we use leavened bread versus unleavened bread. Um, typically in the Jewish tradition, they used to use unleavened bread. Um, I guess maybe part of that is yeast as a living thing. I'm not sure. I'm just kind of making that up. In other words, I don't know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, and they practically probably couldn't wait for it to rise. Yeah. Another advantage of wafers, of course, is it's much easier to count on. True. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's much easier to 
Yeah, exactly. Very helpful. Uh, this is a purificator. Um, again, so this might answer some questions around what happens afterwards. So, um, and each priest will kind of do things a little bit differently, but not too differently that they err in like, I don't know, unorthodox practice. <laughs> but um, a purificator is for cleaning up the vessels. So some priests might wipe until there's no drop of wine left, that it's all sort of cleaned, almost polished. Um, but that's leaving none of sort of Jesus behind, I guess. But then you kind of wash this anyway. So, and then Jesus is on this. And you can run into all sorts of issues the more you think about these things. When we used to have the chillers, you'd have to wipe it around after each group of the people. That's right. That, and you'd have to always be careful to put it over both sides. That's right. So that you burn the cup around. Yeah. I feel terrible saying this. Back in the day when we used to drink from the chalice, <laughs> so you would use a purificator and you would kind of pinch the top and you would wipe um, like that and remove. I mean, it's silver anyway, so that has a little bit of protection. And <laughs> no? Okay. It's alcohol. <laughs> so it's more protection. And then you've got the wipe of the purificator and then you would twist the cup as well, so they're getting a another spot that's not the one you just wiped. But then once you got around everyone, you kind of back onto the same spot. I know in the Catholic Church, the purificators after Mass were taken and washed, mm. and the water was taken out and poured on the garden in case there was any traces of the blood of Christ. Yes, yeah. So again, uh, some priests would consume still today um, the leftover wine and the bread, unless it was being reserved to be taken to the sick or those that couldn't be there. Um, some would find a space outside, um, a, a nice space, maybe like a tree, and they would um, reverently dispose of the wine and, and the wafers there. Um, or some churches, their sink in the vestry um, is a uh, the pipe is left open at the end to pour out onto ground, and so the, the blood of Jesus is still actually going out to open ground. Um, that's still a practice. Um, other people just don't prefer that, and they pour it down the sink or dispose of it that way. Um, and there's different... That's right, yeah. And yeah, it could be that the people assisting them have been told that actually that's the way we do it in, in our parish, and that's normally the theology of whoever's taking the service or runs the church. Yeah, so again, some consume, some dispose of reverently, or some just dispose of, yeah. <laughs> Depends on what they think is happening here. <laughs> and so I'm pouring some wine um, from this like cruet thing. Um, into the chalice, and this might be done during the offering. Oh, I should have thought that through. That's a bit more wine than I was expecting. <laughs> Lucky me. Um, typically, there's another vessel of water, and a, sometimes a little dash of this is added to the wine. And there's two reasons for this. Yeah, and again, some priests are like, only a drop, and some are like, no, um, put more in. Um, and so symbolism is of uh, both the human nature, so that's represented in the water of Jesus, and the divine nature of Jesus represented in the wine. And that comes probably from that story of the wedding at Cana, of Jesus turning water into wine. But there's also the symbolism of when Jesus was pierced on the cross of both blood and water coming out of his side. And so they're mixed together um, in communion and the elements. And so, yeah, there's just lots of different theologies for everything of what's going on. And some people lay it out differently as well. Um, some people might have the, the bread first and then the wine second. That might say something about their theology or not. Or they might just have it side by side. Um, and I might just do that. I can't think of a reason why, other than it's practical. <laughs> and you can 
see the elements for yourselves as well. And a lot of it is just we're trying to make an invisible God present or, or visible to us, hence the, the lit candles and us all seeing the bread and wine. And we typically have the chalice open and the bread, whatever that's in, is open. This is our, our pattern, pattern um, that the bread goes on. And what else have I not explained? Cool. And so there are some prayer books um, scattered around as well. Um, so I invite you to pick up those. So we're on page 420. Uh, 420. So in the prayer books, it's called The Great Thanksgiving. And that's um, yeah, summing up that what Jesus did, um, probably the first thing I did, he did, in fact, was uh, to give thanks uh, for the bread and for the wine. And so we do some of that. So we, we give thanks to God for, for the gifts. So typically before we start the Eucharist proper, there's the offertory um, or the offertory hymn, which an offertory, offertory is taken, and then the, the monetary offering and or the uh, food or items that are going to the food bank, they might come up as well. And sometimes, uh, depending on if the church is a bit higher or not, they might also bring up the uh, wine and the water and the bread um, along with the offering from the congregation. And that symbolism is that it's the, the gifts of the people. So the uh, toil from, you know, the, the goods from our toil. So like the money, the items um, for those that don't have enough and the bread and the wine and then the gifts that we offer over to God um, for his service. And then uh, we say the first words, uh, which uh, the Lord is here, and we'll get into that shortly. Um, that is called the sursum corda. And so that is in Latin, and that is the lift up your hearts phrase. And this is one of the oldest parts of liturgy that is dated back to the third century. So a lot of the words that we use are that old, and I think that's really special. So the Lord is here. God's Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to offer thanks and praise. And so you may see some priests um, lift up their hands like this. Um, they're not really doing anything. Well, they are doing something special. But um, in lifting up their hands, this is one of the most ancient prayer positions, is just lifting your hands. And you'll see that in a lot of the um, old paintings as well. And also with the signing of the cross, that is also one of the earliest sort of acts of prayer. And there's nothing really more to it than that, that it's um, a prayer that we do with our bodies. Um, we're just making a sign of the cross. And there might be moments in the Eucharist where people do that as well. It might be the priest or it might be everyone doing that too. So it is right indeed it is the joy of our salvation, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise through Christ, your only Son. You are the source of all life and goodness through your eternal word. You have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. So a couple of points there is that um, there are thoughts around the Eucharist being an eternal gathering. So we are remembering Christ or God's act in the past, and we're remembering God being present with us in this moment, and we're also remembering what, how God will act in the future in terms of salvation. So we can see this act of communion as an eternal act. It's also, uh, we are gathered and we are doing this together, um, 
before the, <laughs> the 1950s. That <laughs> sounds like a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, so before that, uh, typically the priest or the altar would be up, right up against the back wall, and the priest would be facing the other way. Um, so you'd see um, a liturgical vestment called a, a chasuble, and that had a lot of decorations on the back because that would be largely what you see for most of the time. And there are some thoughts around that that actually it gives the priest not having everyone looking at them and that they can feel a bit more comfortable to pray to God along with everyone else. And some view that as the priest being on the same level as the people, while others might think that actually the priest is more working as an intermediary. And some people agree or disagree with that as well. But typically today we have the priest facing the people and we're all gathered around the table together. And in some churches, um, everyone might hop up and literally gather around the table as well. When we sinned and turned away, you called us back to yourself and gave your son to share our human nature. By his death on the cross, he made the one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world and freed us from the bondage of sin. You raised him to life triumphant over death. You exalted him in glory. You have, in him, you have made us a holy people by sending upon us your holy and life-giving spirit. And so it's in communion that we ask for the Holy Spirit as well. Therefore, with the faithful who rests in him, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And of course, with that part, you're never quite sure which way the priest is going to go, whether they're just going to stop with the first part or carry on with the rest of it. And so that part is, is the sanctus, which is Latin for holy, and it comes from Isaiah 6. And so we've included that here as well. And we move to the prayer of consecration. And so there are different, um, again, beliefs about when this actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus or when he becomes present in it. Um, some of people uh, believe that it's uh, when we say the words, remember me. And so in that moment, you might see some people sign themselves with the cross, and that's one. Mo that, and the reason why people are doing that is they believe that is the moment where um, the wine is not merely wine anymore, and the bread's not merely bread anymore. And the same with the cup. Remember me. People might do the sign of the cross, or the priest um, that's upstanding might genuflect, which looks something like this. And um, that's again, instead of making a sign of the cross, they do that as a a reverence thing. Um, other people might believe that something happens when we uh, do a part later on, when we're asking for the Holy Spirit to be present um, in the elements of bread and wine. Some people believe the change happens then. So yeah, up to you <laughs> as well. So all glory and thanksgiving to you, Holy Father. On the night before he died, your son, Jesus Christ, took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And sometimes the priest might make a sign of the cross. Again, um, that's just um, asking God to do something, but in a physical movement. And after supper, he took the cup. When he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Your death we show forth. Your resurrection we proclaim. Your coming we await. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Therefore, loving God, recalling your great goodness to us in Christ, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which we offer through Christ, our great high priest. So what we're saying there is that we're remembering the reason that we're doing this is because Christ gave his life for us. And that uh, we are doing a sacrifice, but the sacrifice is our own praise of thanksgiving. And some priests might lift up the uh, bread and the wine at this point. Again, it could be a symbolism thing. Others might say it goes too far and that we're adoring. Um, But that's just another decision. And then we've got the epiclesis, uh, which is this other moment that some people might think that Christ becomes present. And so the priest might do something with their hands. They might not. They might form a cross at this point. Um, I tend to... um, do that with my hands, Um, that for me, one, that's what I've been shown, (laughs) and two, it's um, this symbolism, an act of prayer that we can all see, and that we're asking the Holy Spirit to do something in this time of communion, and so that's just a sign of that. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine, which we receive, may be to us the body and blood of Christ, and that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. United in Christ with all who stand before you, in earth and heaven, we worship you, O God, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing, honour and glory be yours, here and forever, now and forever. Amen. And so that's that eternal moment where we're gathered uh, with all on earth. We sort of represent them here, uh, if they're not here, and actually everyone from heaven. So it's an eternal act that we're coming together with God. And what better way to prepare ourselves to receive communion than with the Lord's Prayer? So we typically either do the Lord's Prayer beforehand or we do it now. And so we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And this next moment is called the fraction, and that's uh, where the priest may uh, take the bread, uh, normally the priest wafer, because it's a lot bigger than the small wafer, and we can all roughly see it. And uh, in the fraction, all we're doing is we're remembering what Jesus did on the cross, that his body was broken for us. And that can be quite an emotional moment as well. And we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share the one bread. And then we might pray together the prayer of humble access. Which is the next part. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation, and you share your bread with sinners. 
So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. And of course, there's the invitation to draw near and receive the body and blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, in remembrance that he died for us. Let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And that part, just in case you didn't get our theology there, was let us feed on him in our hearts with faith and with thanksgiving. And so when we hand out communion, um, we're basically saying what we believe that it is, so the body of Christ, and who it's for. It's for you. And so those words, the body of Christ given for you, or the blood of Christ poured for you, that's simply saying what this is and that it's for everyone. Um, again, there are some churches that will say all baptised are welcome, and there may be other churches that don't say that. They just say all are welcome. Again, different views on those things. Um, so, no, you don't have to be baptised to receive communion. And you don't have to be confirmed, which is another rite in the Anglican church as well. Um, all are welcome. And so I invite you to come forward and receive the body and blood of Jesus. And I think you're free to just take it as you receive it as well. Uh, page 428. And we'll pray this one together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. And keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. So go now to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace. Amen. We go in the name of Christ. And I quite love that last part as well because we're, we've been given life and then we're sent to give life to the world. And then we go out in peace to spread God's peace in the name of Christ. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, sorry, I ran out of time to get to the questions, but we may have answered some as we've gone along. And, and feel free to ask questions anytime, <laughs> and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, yes, so uh, we'll pray as we finish off again. Uh, so thank you, God, uh, for this time together. Thank you that we could share a meal and remember what you have done for us and receive from you what you have for us and that you charge us to go out into the world to spread your gospel, your love, and bring life to those who need life. Amen. Well, have a good night, everyone. Yeah. And we'll see you, if not for Alpha, uh, next, next, next term <laughs> for Soul Lab. <laughs>